What happens to assets when a currency dies? When something like a stock is denominated in dollars, what happens to it when the dollar fails? Does that asset just cease to exist? Does it crash to zero or does it somehow make it to the other side? Now, lucky for us, we are not flying blind here. Episodes of currency failures from hyperinflation have happened countless times in recent history. This means there's a lot of data that we can pull from to help us navigate a hyperinflationary currency collapse. Brief note on why I'm specifying a hyperinflationary currency failure and not one through deflation. Basically, it's because no currency has ever died from deflation. Currencies fail from overprinting, from inflation, from hyperinflation, not the other way around. And while I don't personally see hyperinflation as an imminent threat in the United States, I do see it as a threat longer term. And because of that, I think it is wise to know how to handle it once it does get here. So let's start with a baseline, just normal reality for the past couple of decades, what people generally assume is normal financially speaking. People have savings accounts for their shorter term needs. They invest in the stock market for their longer term needs. You have policy makers at central banks targeting inflation of 2% over the long run. And you have an average stock market return of nine or 10%. Keep in mind at this point, stocks are denominated in dollars. You pay with dollars to buy those stocks. And then when you sell those stocks, you receive dollars. You take those dollars that you got, you invest them in a bank account, earning interest in dollars. At this point, everything is denominated in dollars. A note here about denomination. If we're talking about an asset like debt, then the denomination means something. It means that you are going to get a specific number of dollars back, right? Like with a mortgage, you owe a specific number of dollars. That debt is denominated nominated in dollars. But with other things like the stock market or Bitcoin or gold, it's not really accurate to say that it's denominated in dollars. It's more accurate to say that it's commonly priced in dollars. Like when you go to the grocery store and buy that big box of Twinkies, you could say it's denominated in dollars. But if you're going to try and buy that same box of Twinkies in Europe, you're not going to be able to pay with dollars. You're going to have to exchange your dollars for something else like a euro or a pound in order to buy that. And so keep in mind that distinction between denominated in dollars and priced in dollars, because when something is priced in a currency, it's a little bit more fluid. Now let's move on to phase two, where we have some sort of crisis that causes the central planners to print a bunch of money to paper it over. A good example of this would be 2020 when they printed a few trillion dollars to hand out stimulus checks and bail out the entire economy. Now it's important to note here that inflation doesn't hit an economy evenly distributed. I talk all the time about how if you increase the money supply by, let's say, double, then prices on average you would expect to somewhat double. But it doesn't actually happen as evenly as that. This is because the money isn't evenly distributed. Take, for example, a stock like Tesla. In August of 2020, Tesla did a five for one stock split. That meant for every one share that you had before, you now have five shares. Novice investors who have no experience with stock splits initially look at this and think, well, that's great news. Actually, it's no news. Because if you had 10 shares before at $1 a piece, then you had $10 worth of that stock. And then if they do a 10 for one stock split, you now have 100 shares. Because if you had one share of a stock before and it was worth $10 per share, you have $10 worth of that stock. Now let's say they do a 10 for one stock split and so you get excited because you're gonna go from having one share to 10 shares. The problem is nothing is changing with the valuation of the company. And so, yes, you have 10 shares now that that split has happened, but each share is now only worth $1. So you still only have $10 in that company. Simply put, they take all of the existing shares and just slice each share up, both in quantity of shares and therefore in the value of those shares. Now, technically the same thing could happen with dollars. If they were to take every single dollar out there, like if you've got a hundred bucks in your bank account, they'd make it $200. If you make a hundred grand a year, suddenly you make 200 grand a year. If those Twinkies cost $10, now they cost $20. And just 
just as with a stock split like Tesla went through, where there was absolutely no change to the value of the business as a result, an evenly distributed increase in the supply of money would also have absolutely zero result. The quantity of money would increase at the same pace that the value of that money decreases for everybody all at the same time evenly distributed. The problem is this isn't how money is printed. It is not evenly distributed. The express purpose, the only point to doing it is to allow some people to have more of that purchasing power first. And the way this works is that whoever gets to spend that newly created money first gets all that extra purchasing power at the expense of whoever gets that money last. So the early receivers, in this case, the government gets all that money first and they get to spend it however they want. At this point, prices haven't yet adjusted higher, so they're able to take that new purchasing power and buy a bunch of stuff at the old prices. As that new money works its way throughout the economy, just like an auction, it bids up the prices of everything across the board. By the time that money works its way to the last receivers of the money, they've already been paying those higher prices and that new additional money that they have does them no good. The wealth has already been transferred from them to the early receivers of the money. In this process, savers get screwed because if you're one of the last receivers of the new money, you've got 10 grand in your bank account, maybe that will last you six months. By the time that new money works its way throughout the system, that 10 grand you've been holding on to in your savings account won't be able to last you six months of expenses anymore. Maybe now it only will last you for five months or four months or three months. Essentially, the purchasing power of your dollars gets transferred to somebody else the more they print the money. Now, very obviously, the net result of this is that people are going to save less. Why hold on to savings when you're just gonna see your purchasing power eroded? Instead, you're gonna do something else with your money and have your purchasing power eroded at a slower pace. This is why many people will instead choose to put their money into the stock market. At this point, the main concern that people have is losing as little purchasing power as possible to inflation. Keep your money in your savings account. Let's say you lose 10% every year. If you put it in stocks, maybe you only gain 1% per year. So net, you're still losing 9% to inflation, but that's still better than savings, which is losing 10%. This means that the incentive drives money into stocks, regardless of how high those valuations get. Even if the stocks are only producing 1% a year, that's still better than savings. In the old world, people used to demand 5%, 10%, 15% returns from risk assets like stocks. But facing inflation on the other side, the only thing they care about now is not losing as much. This means stocks get very expensive from a valuation perspective. Now let's fast forward because we know when governments intervene to stop a crisis through printing, ultimately they plant the seeds for larger crises down the road that they will also have to paper over and fix through printing, which will again cause even more inflation. You can look at countless recent examples like Lebanon, Turkey, Argentina, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Brazil, and many others to see this exact same thing play out over and over and over again. The value of the currency starts to drop. When the value of this currency starts to drop, two things that are interesting start to take place in the economy. Number one, eventually people start using multiple currencies. And number two, people start buying anything as quickly as possible so long as they don't have to hold on to dollars. I have a friend who lives in Lebanon right now who in 2021 earned the record that nobody wants of having the worst inflation rate in the world. Basically what happens here is that people start using multiple currencies wherever and whenever possible. Nobody wants the old currency that is currently going through hyperinflation. And so in order to save themselves the trouble of having to take the currency that's hyperinflating and then go and exchange it for dollars, they will sell you goods in dollars so that they can get the harder currency. Or in the case of Lebanon, sometimes euros as well. As the currency hyperinflates and becomes less and less stable, then more and more parallel markets pop up and people start using and trading in other currencies. Number two, people buy anything they can so long as it means they don't have to hold on to that currency that is going through hyperinflation. They will buy goods, they will buy physical items, but if they can, they will buy assets as well. 
And because at this point, people are trying to dump the currency as fast as possible, so long as they can buy anything, it means that those stock valuations go up even faster, like a hockey stick. Check out this chart of the Venezuelan stock market during their hyperinflation. It's a hockey stick. No, it's not a straight line. As you can see in 2017, there was about a 25 to 40% drop in the stock market, but ultimately the overall direction was vertical. We can see the same thing here with the solid blue line being the stock market priced in marks during the hyperinflation in the Weimar Republic in Germany. As you'll notice on the y-axis with all the zeros, this is a log chart. So you can imagine how quickly those prices of their stocks are accelerating higher. As an American living under the dollar standard, it might be very difficult to see how any other currency might ever be used in daily trade. If you've ever traveled around the world, especially around Europe, you're very familiar with this. You understand that different places use different money. And when you go from one place to another, you might have to exchange currency. And that same sort of thing starts to happen in a country that starts to go through hyperinflation. People start just asking for payment in other currencies. And no big changes need to take place for this to happen. Anything can right now be priced in anything. You can visit the website PricedInGold.com and you can select any item to see what its price is in gold. We can see that measured in gold, the price of Big Macs have been declining since 1995. Right now on any trading software like TradingView, you can go in and see the price of the S&P 500 measured in Bitcoin. You can see the price of Amazon shares in Japanese yen. Let's say you've got a house right now worth $400,000. Well, if you wanted to, you could try selling that house in gold ounces. Rounding gold to $2,000 per ounce, your house would be selling for 200 ounces of gold. Now, that trade could happen directly or if the person wanted to, they could take their 400 grand, go buy 200 ounces of gold and give you that gold, or they could give you the cash and then you could go buy the gold. It doesn't matter, it's all the same. Everything can be priced in anything and that trade can either happen directly or indirectly. Now, when we see a stock chart that goes up and to the right like a hockey stick, like it did in Venezuela, or like it did in the Weimar Republic in Germany, this means by definition that stock market is outperforming the currency because it takes more units of that currency to buy the same units of stocks. And so we know while the hyperinflation is taking place, stock prices are going up. But what happens when the currency actually fails, when people stop using it? And no matter how much of that currency you have, nobody will accept it for payment for anything. Well, at this point, once that happens, everything that's being traded is already being traded for using other forms of money. In the case of the Weimar Republic, it was gold and silver. And in other times and other places, it's been other harder currencies, many times like the dollar. There are two options a government has at this point. They can either restart with a new fiat currency or they can use the currency that the people are already using. If they restart with a new fiat, it always fails. Essentially, nothing has changed here. The old one failed and the people don't trust that the government will do anything different with the new currency. It has a new name maybe, and it has less zeros on it, but it's the same people in charge and who knows if they're gonna do the same thing with it. So the new one always fails. But whenever the government chooses to just start using the currency that people are already using, like gold and silver or sometimes dollars, then usually that new one sticks. Basically, it's because if the government wants any purchasing power, they've gotta get some of the money that people are already willing to accept for payment. What this means is that when the dollar dies and a new currency, whatever it is, rises up from the ashes, stocks will still be around. Those companies will still be in existence and those shares will still be traded. Now, certainly it's possible that in this process, the country goes full commie and they confiscate, nationalize all the wealth, make private property, private ownership completely illegal. And obviously in that case, no, you wouldn't own your stocks anymore, but we're just talking about what happens in a hyperinflationary collapse and not what happens in a headlong rush towards hell. So just like Twinkies and cars and houses, sellers of stocks will no longer be accepting dollars 
dollars, they'll just be accepting the new currency. And by the way, that new currency has been accepted with those dollars for a while, the whole time the dollar was going through hyperinflation. And now that nobody accepts dollars anymore for payment for anything, then those new stocks will be sold for other forms of currency, maybe gold, maybe Bitcoin, maybe Yuan, who knows? But there is one final issue here, and it is a big issue, and that is the valuation. Remember this chart, what happened with stocks in Germany, or this one, what happened with stocks in Venezuela? Prices got absolutely insane because people were willing to buy anything and everything so long as they didn't have to hold on to dollars anymore. So even if the price of stocks got so high that you could only anticipate even a 1% return on them, that's still better than losing purchasing power in the money. And if you only expect a risk asset like a stock to produce 1%, that means it's very expensive. That means the valuation is crazy high. This means that once that mechanism is no longer there, the mechanism that has driven all of that purchasing power into stocks, once that is gone, valuations are set to plummet. Nobody any longer has the incentive to plow all of their dollars as fast as possible into stocks because We've got a new money now. We can save and not risk losing our purchasing power to inflation. I can get a real positive return from saving. Maybe it's 0%, maybe it's only 1%, but I'm not setting it on fire anymore, so I'm willing to save some of my money now instead of investing at all. Which means that for a risk asset, valuations have to be low enough to where there is a decently high chance that it will produce a high enough return on top of what you could get by just doing nothing, saving. Which means that those old valuations must come down and prices will come down as a result. And that's exactly what you see happening here with the dotted blue line, which is the German stock market as measured in US dollars, which at the time were gold. Yes, the stock market goes up and to the right, even measured in sound money until the very end when it starts to fall back down again and valuations in real terms, prices in real money start to come back down to earth. So what's the conclusion here? If and when the dollar starts to die by hyperinflation, it can happen very quickly. But if you keep your money in cash, in savings, you're guaranteed to lose it all. Eventually, nobody will accept it for payment for anything. Putting it in the stock market, it does a lot better. The price goes up. You preserve at least some of your purchasing power. If dollars stop being accepted for payment, no worries, you can still sell those stocks. It'll just be selling them for the new currency that replaces the dollar. It's vital to know that it's almost impossible you're gonna be able to time this perfectly. You're not gonna buy stocks at the exact bottom, the start before hyperinflation. You're not gonna sell them perfectly before the valuations start to come back down to earth after the dollar fails, which means you do have a high probability that you will lose some purchasing power if you do invest in stocks through hyperinflation, but you're gonna lose a lot less than just holding it in savings. It's also worth noting that some people will try and gamble and they'll try and pick the new money on the other side, thinking that they will increase their purchasing power drastically by buying that new form of money now before it's widely used as money in the future. This might be gold. This might be Bitcoin. It might be a new fiat currency. Who knows? It might be a central bank digital currency. But that's a point. We don't know, we don't have a crystal ball and any attempt to do so is just a gamble. And so personally, I would much rather buy some Bitcoin, some gold, some other currencies, have a little bit in cash and also invest in stocks that are hedged because that way I'm spreading my bets around and I'm not gambling all on one specific outcome that if it doesn't happen, I lose it all. So hyperinflation makes stocks go up. You'll lose purchasing power most likely, but you'll save a lot more of it compared to the cash that goes away. And in the end, those stocks will be repriced. They'll be re-denominated in a new currency. You'll be able to sell them for the new currency. And on the other side, start to enjoy valuations that are more normal, historically speaking, when we have sound money. And for more on protecting yourself through these financial storms, consider becoming a member at Heresy Financial University. You'll get unlimited access to a growing library of financial courses that'll teach you how to grow and protect your wealth. Link is in the description below. As always, really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.